Hi, um, well, welcome back to this course on infrastructure finance. Uh, this is lecture 18. For the last few lectures, uh, we have been talking about various features of project finance, the advantages and the motivations for which people actually use project finance. Now, we will move forward a bit and then talk about project finance markets. What are project finance markets? Uh, project finance markets essentially we call them as the various sources of capital that are used to fund project finance investments. But before we actually go on to talking what are project finance markets, let us talk try and spend some time to discuss the thought questions that we put forward in the previous lecture. So, question number 1 is what are the broad trends seen in project financing. Before we actually get on to uh, let me actually show you some um, broad trends uh, that uh, has been captured in the uh, literature. So, this table that I have shown here gives a distribution of project finance loans across various industry segments. So, this table is from an article that applied in that appeared in journal of applied corporate finance in 2000. So, in a sense it is a little bit dated, but nevertheless it helps us to understand the broad trends that are normally seen in uh, project finance transactions. So, what you have in this table is on the left hand side column you have the different industry categories. And then subsequently the next three columns talk about the details regarding the project finance loan and then the subsequent three columns talk about the details of all the loan samples that are there in the database. So, if you look at the industrial category there are several industrial categories, but they have been broadly divided into four or five categories. The first category is um, the commercial and the industrial segment that consists of various sectors like chemicals, plastic and rubber, communications that will also involve uh, telecommunication and then you have construction and heavy engineering, then you have forest products and packaging, hotels and leisure, mining and natural resources, motorway operators, oil and gas, petrochemicals, steel and aluminum. And then you have the utilities sector which essentially comprises of electricity and other energy utilities. Then you have financial institutions, there is a category for transportation that includes transport excluding airlines and shipping. And then you have government agencies and then a category called other. So, if you really look at these various industry categories and we also look at the number of project finance loans that are seen in each of these categories. So, you find there are some industries that clearly dominate in terms of the loans that are taken and also the value of these loans. So, if you look at the percent of total value of loans taken in the project finance category, you actually find oil and gas accounts for the highest 18.8 percent of the total value of project loans is actually seen in the oil and gas sector. Now, if you actually compare the value of loans for all the syndicated loans, oil and gas sector accounts only for 8.8 percent. So, in essence if you look at it, oil and gas accounts for a larger percentage of a project finance loans. So, similarly you look at other segment let us say for example, communications. Uh, communications account for 8.1 percent of the total project finance loan, whereas if you look at all the syndicated loans, communication accounts for only 3.8 percent of the total loan value. So, what does it indicate? Um, this indicates that there are some industries that are more amenable for project finance transactions. And some industries may not be so amenable for project finance transactions. Let us also look at the utilities. Electricity accounts for 21.5 percent of 
all the project finance loans. So, in essence electricity is the largest in this table in terms of accounting for the total loan value of project finance. But if you look at all the syndicated loans, electricity accounts for only 5.4 percent. And then if you move down, you find transportation accounting for 7.7 uh, percent, which also is, um, this also is reasonably higher as compared to the number that we see for all the syndicated loans. So, just generally if you look at it, there are some industry segments which predominate the project finance loan transactions, indicating that these sectors or projects in these sectors are more capable of getting funded in a project finance mode. So, an important thing that you want to look at is these sectors are largely infrastructure sectors. Now, which are the sectors that are accounting for a substantial percentage of project finance loans? So, there is communications, there is mining and natural resources, there is oil and gas, then you have electricity, then you have transportation. So, put together these sectors account for a substantial amount of project finance loan transactions and all of these sectors are what we call as infrastructure sectors. So, that is the reason why we normally say project finance loans are more suited for infrastructure sectors, because we see a large proportion of project finance loans in the infrastructure sector. But nevertheless, it may also interest you to know that the principles of project finance are now being applied in several other sectors as well. See for example, in the, in the information technology sector, India is as you know is a very, very um, uh, a leading player as far as software services is concerned. So, today what happens is when several overseas clients are planning to set up offshore development centers for developing software that are specifically related to their um, products or services, then these offshore development centers are being set up as special purpose vehicles and these are being funded on a project finance mode. So, the principles of project financing that we see um, in the infrastructure sector is also now being applied to some of the other newer sectors, because uh, project finance is seen as a better way of allocating risk to those parties that are best equipped to manage them. Let us also look at um, the syndicated loans um, uh, just to uh, contrast. So, if you look at the syndicated loans, um, the financial institutions account for a large percentage of the syndicated loans in our sample. So, 18.5 percent of the loans are being made for the uh, financial institutions. And you also have oil and gas, um, which accounts for 8.8 percent, accounting for a significant percentage of the loan sample. But um, bearing these two sectors, you do not normally find, um, you don't normally find um, a couple of sectors that are dominating um, the syndicated loans category, and you actually find um, several um, sectors that account for. Uh, that account for a part of uh, the syndicated loan um, syndicated loan category. So, this is as far as trends uh, in project finance when we see from the perspective of different industry sectors. Now, we can also look at um, the trends in project finance in terms of geographies. Let us look at the next table. So, when you look at um, the geographic um, distribution of project finance in terms of the countries that have actually used project finance to borrow, again we look at the project finance loans vis a vis all the other loans. So, in this table again taken from the same article that I talked about earlier, you have in the left hand column all the geographical regions and um, specifically you also have uh, different countries. And then we talk about the number of loans in each of the countries and then the total value of the loan. So, there are several interesting differences that you may actually see in project finance loans as compared to all the other loans. So, let us say the first example is North America and within North America we have United States. 
So, if you look at project finance loan, 16.8 percent of the project finance loans are actually for projects that are in United States, but if you actually look at all the syndicated loans, 61.4 percent of all the syndicated loans are actually given to borrowers in the United States. So, you see the disparity here. In the overall loan sample, a large proportion close to two thirds of the borrowers are actually located in the United States, but if you actually look at project finance loans, it is less than one fifth, only 16.8 percent of the borrowers are based in United States. Then which are the geographical regions that actually dominate in project finance category? So, if you find, uh, uh, if you actually go down, you find Western Europe that accounts for close to one fourth of all the project finance loan and this is higher as compared to the proportion that the western Europe accounts for in the overall loan category. If you go down further, what you actually find southeast Asia accounts for a fairly substantial amount of project finance loan, but in the overall loan category. Southeast Asia does not account for such a large proportion. So, for example, only 5.2 percent of the overall loans are from borrowers in Southeast Asia, but if you look at project finance loan, 23.8 percent of the borrowers are based in Southeast Asia. So, within Southeast Asia, there are several countries like China, Hong Kong, Indonesia, South Korea, Malaysia, and Thailand, and so on. So, broadly, what you look at it there are a large uh, domination by some, some countries. Again, if you look at Australia and Pacific, um, Australia and Pacific accounts for a higher proportion of project finance loan as compared to the overall loan category. Similarly, Latin America, Latin America accounts for a higher proportion of project finance loan as compared to the overall loan category. So, what can we actually see from, uh, from this trend? Point number one, you can actually see that a large proportion of project finance loan are actually given to borrowers that are based in developing countries. So, when you look at Africa, you look at Indian subcontinent, you look at Southeast Asia. So, the proportion of project finance loans in this geographical regions are higher than the proportion of loans in the overall loan sample that we have. So, project finance loans are essentially seen in those countries uh, that are largely in the developing sector. We also have Latin America, which are actually having a higher proportion of project finance loans. Incidentally, we also find that a large proportion of infrastructure, many of the developing countries are engaged in massive development of infrastructure to meet the existing shortfall in infrastructure capacity. And one inference that we can actually make from this trend is that a large part of project finance loan are being taken to fund infrastructure development in this geographical regions. There are also some countries um, which are developed such as Australia and United Kingdom, where we have substantial amount of a project finance loan. So, the logic in um, in, in, this sec, in this explanation for this trend is that, in these two geographical regions, you actually find substantial private participation in infrastructure development. So, when you actually have private participation in infrastructure development, most of this private investment tend to happen on a project finance basis and that is probably the reason why we have a large amount of, um, uh, why we actually have these geographical regions accounting for a large proportion of a project finance loans. So, to sum up the trend as far as geographical regions are concerned is that developing countries account for a large proportion of project finance loan and this trend is very different from what we see actually see in the overall loan sample. The overall loan sample is strongly dominated by the United States, but we do not see that kind of a strong domination as far as project finance loan sample is concerned. So, now let us look at uh, some more analysis. So, this is an analysis that was done uh, at, uh, 
at IIT Madras in a part of a research project. So, this consists of um, project finance investments that happened over um, close to 20 year period starting from 1991 to 2009. And we have categorized the investment as those investments that happened in developed countries vis a vis uh, investments that happened in uh, developing countries. So, if you really look at it within the developed countries, the value of projects that have actually been funded by project finance have increased over time. So, between 1991 to 95, out of the total sample, only 6 percent of the projects were during this 1991 to 1995 period. And then subsequently between 96 to 2000, a large proportion at about 25 percent of the loans and projects that were implemented between 2001 and 2005 accounted for 30 percent. And in recent, the most recent time period 2006 to 2009 accounted for 13 percent of the total loan value. But if you look at the developing countries, the trend is more or less similar. The first period 1991 to 95 accounts for only 6 percent of the total value of the projects that have been funded during this 19 year period. But as we move to more recent times, we actually find the proportion of projects increasing. So, this actually gives an indication that the number of projects that are being funded on a project finance basis is increasing with time. We find in recent years more and more projects are being funded by project finance as compared to what it has been in the past. So, what could be the reason for this? The reason for this could be as we get more and more experience in terms of implementing project finance transactions, there is a greater amount of comfort in using these structures. Bankers are more comfortable in lending to project finance investments. The sponsors are more comfortable in implementing project on a project finance basis. All the other stakeholders could be suppliers, customers, the government, all of them have achieved a certain amount of understanding, obtained a certain amount of comfort in implementing project finance. So, that is the reason why we actually find a large number of projects in recent years using a project finance transactions. At an overall level, you still find the number of projects that are using project finance is higher in developed countries as compared to developing countries. The total projects that were funded on a project finance basis is more than 2100, whereas in developing countries it is 1200. Now, it is possible that the database might not have captured all the projects in developing countries, but nevertheless it illustrates the fact that a lot of projects in developed countries are also using project finance. Next, we will look at um, classifying based on the region of financing. So, we have broadly classified um, the whole world into three broad regions. So, you have the Americas. So, the Americas comprise both um, the South America and the South American regions and then the Asia Pacific which actually comprises a very, very vast entire Asia, Australia, Middle East. So, that will uh, the Middle East uh, I am sorry the Middle East comes in the next segment. So, the entire Asia and Australia comes under the Asia Pacific and then you have the EMEA which actually comprise the whole of Europe, Middle East and Africa. So, between um, these three regions if you actually look at it. EMEA accounts for the largest proportion both in terms of projects and in terms of the value of project finance transactions in the developed countries. 
um, 58 percent of the total projects and 55 percent in terms of loan value is for projects that are based in the EMEA region. So, Americas and Asia Pacific do not dominate, Americas occupy the second row, second, second position and Asia Pacific the third position. But if you look at developing countries, there is a slight uh, change in the ranking. Asia Pacific accounts for the largest number of projects that are using project finance transactions, though in terms of value EMEA occupies the number one slot. But more importantly what you actually see is the distribution of project finance among the three regions in developing countries is more or less in a very close range as compared to what we actually see in the case of developing countries. Each of these three segments roughly account for about one third in terms of number of projects and in terms of the total value of the projects Asia Pacific and EMEA are reasonably close whereas, Americas do not actually account for a large number of uh, Americas actually accounts for only 20 percent of the project finance loan value. Uh, next we actually look at uh, classifying based on the project sector. So, the entire sample was classified or restricted only to infrastructure and this infrastructure was largely on five different sectors. We have oil and gas, we have the power sector, then there is telecommunications, there is transport and then this is water supply and sanitation. So, again we have actually split the projects and the total loan value by developed countries and developing countries across these sectors. So, you actually find some interesting trends here. Power sector accounts for the largest number of projects in developed countries. and also in terms of the total value of the projects. But if you look at developing countries, oil and gas accounts for the largest proportion of loan and it also accounts for a significant proportion of the number of projects that are implemented on a project finance basis. Bearing this slight difference, uh, the trend is more or less the same in other sectors. Uh, transportation has a slightly higher proportion in developed countries, whereas in developing countries the proportion on telecommunication and transportation is more or less same at least in terms of the total value of uh, projects. So, what you actually find in this trend line is that the tendency is to increase the use of project finance mode of funding infrastructure projects in recent years as compared to what we see in the early 90s. You actually find Asia Pacific and EMEA dominating project finance transactions as far as the developing countries are concerned. And as far as sectors are concerned, if you leave aside oil and gas, the trend in the other infrastructure sectors is more or less same between developed countries and developing countries as far as using project finance mechanism is concerned. Let us look at two important parameters that normally see in a project finance transaction. One is a project cost and second is a gearing ratio. So, project cost is the total investment that is being made in this project and then the gearing ratio is the ratio of debt to total capital 
that is being used for the project. So, as we know project finance investments have a substantial amount of debt and what we have tried and do is we will try and compare the cost of projects that use project finance between developed and developing countries. So, when you look at developed countries the mean project cost was 444.67, this is in dollar million, but if you look at developing countries, the average project cost, average project cost is 656.58 million dollars. So, there is a substantial difference and this difference when it is tested for statistical significance was significant at the 99 percent level. So, this indicates that projects that use a non recourse or a project finance transaction are of a higher value in terms of in the developing countries as compared to developed countries. Developing countries, borrowers in developing countries, if they use a project finance mode, they are able to implement projects of a larger size, of a larger scale. Next, we look at the gearing ratio. The gearing ratio for a developed country is 0.87 whereas, for the developing country is 0 0.79. So, these are the average values that you see for developed and developing countries. Again the difference between the developed and developing countries is significant at the 1 percent level. So, that means, on an average projects based in developed countries are able to achieve a much higher leverage as compared to projects in developing countries. Now, this is but natural, why? Because the risk level in developed countries are expected to be much lower, the markets are considered to be a lot more robust in developed countries as compared to developing countries. In developing countries, there is a certain amount of a country risk which is literally absent when you look at developed countries. So, therefore, the lenders are prepared to invest a higher proportion of the project cost in developed countries as compared to developing countries. Now, this trend is going to be very similar in all the other borrowings as well. This is not very peculiar to project finance loans because the systemic risk that you actually see in a developing country is larger, higher as compared to what is seen in the developed countries. And consequently, you actually find borrowers are able to uh, borrow a higher proportion of project cost in developed countries as compared to developing countries. Okay, now, we kind of understand the broad trends as far as project finance is concerned. Now, let us go to the second thought question. So, the question was in terms of loan parameters do project finance loan differ from other loan categories. So, the first thing is we have to understand what are loan parameters. So, if you look at a loan structure, so you have different parameters associated with a loan. The first characteristic of a loan is what is called as your loan amount. So, loan amount indicates what is the total level of borrowing in a particular project or a particular investment. The second is called the maturity or tenor. 
So, how long is this loan for? The loan has a maturity period by which time the loan had to be repaid to the investors. So, is it 5 years, is it 6 years, is it 10 years? So, that is the maturity or the tenor. And then you have what is called as your interest rate. What is the interest rate that is being charged by the lenders? Is it 5 percent, is it 6 percent, is it 8 percent? So, that is an important parameter associated with the loan. And then we also have what is called as your a fixed or a floating interest rate, right? fixed or so many times you actually have what is called as your fixed interest rate that is interest rate does not change to the loan tenor, but in many cases we also have what is called as a floating rate. So, in a floating rate the interest is the interest on the loan is benchmarked to certain benchmark rate and if there is a change in the benchmark rate then the interest rate on the loan also changes. So, there is what is called as your fixed or a floating rate. And then you also have type of repayment, right? you also have type of repayment. Does the repayment? So when you talk about repayment, is specifically mention about uh, principal repayment. Okay. So the interest, whatever is accrued, is has to be paid whenever the interest is due. But when you talk about principal repayment, is the principal repaid at one shot at the end? So loans of that type is called as a bullet repayment. And then you have certain loans where the principal is repaid throughout the loan tenure. So, such loans are called as your amortization loans and then you have another category of loan where the principal repayment increases with maturity. That is in the initial years of the loan, the principal repayment is lower, but as the repayment period nears, then the level of principal repaid is higher. So, that is called as your balloon repayment. So, we also have different types of um, uh, principal repayment that is normally associated with the loan. So, if you look at loan parameters, these are the major parameters that we have to be aware of. So, now the question is in terms of this different loan parameters, do project finance loan differ from other loan categories. Now, what are the other loan categories? Let us also talk about that. So, this table talks about five different loan categories. So, you have project finance loans, you have corporate control loans. What are corporate control loans? Corporate control loans are those loans that are actually taken to fund a merger or an acquisition transaction. Then you have general purpose corporate loans. General purpose corporate loans are loans that are taken for routine corporate expenditure and investment needs. Then you have capital structure loans. So, capital structure loans are taken with respect to any changes or restructuring in the capital structure. So, for example, if a company wants to buy back equity and if it is borrowing to buy back certain amount of equity, that will be called as a capital structure loan. Then you have fixed asset based loans. If the company is actually borrowing to finance purchase of an equipment, to finance development of a construction, which results in creation of certain amount of fixed assets, these are called as your fixed asset based loans. So, this table which is again obtained from the earlier mentioned journal of applied corporate finance article talks about five loan categories project finance loans corporate control loans general corporate purpose loans capital structure loans and fixed asset based loans and then 
it provides values of certain loan parameters across these five loan categories. So, now let us look at the loan size. Loan size is nothing but the loan amount. So, if you look at the loan size, the average loan size in a project finance loan is on the higher side. It is only second it is about 128 million. It may be lower as compared to corporate control loans or capital structure loans, but it is definitely higher when you compare it with the fixed asset based loans or a general corporate purpose loan. So, normally you find a project finance loan not small, it is definitely not the highest amount, but it is definitely not small. Now, let us look at the average maturity or the loan tenor in terms of years. So, if you look at the average maturity, project finance loans have the highest maturity as compared to all the other loan categories. So, the average maturity is 8.6 years and as compared to either a corporate control loan or a capital structure loan that is substantially higher. The fixed asset based loans come closer, the average maturity is 8.1 for a fixed asset based loan. So, in a very fundamental way, a project finance loans are very similar to fixed asset based loan in the sense that uh, both of them result in the creation of certain amount of fixed assets and because of that they are able to actually get a loan for a higher tenor. If the life of the fixed asset is of a long duration, then it is also possible to borrow for a longer period in line with the life of the asset. So, that is why you actually find the maturity period in a project finance loans are higher. Uh, then you actually find proportion of loans that are having a fixed price or a fixed interest. So, you actually find the proportion of loans with the fixed price is the highest as far as project finance loans are concerned. So, 13.9 percent of all the project finance loans have fixed interest, whereas this proportion is very less for all the other loan categories. Then you actually look at loans to US borrowers. At the overall level, you find that 58, 55.8 percent of all the loans are made to the US borrowers. But as far as project finance loans are concerned, only 13.9 percent of the project finance loans are made to US borrowers. So, a very a small proportion of the borrowers who actually take project finance loan are in the US. So, this again kind of indicates that there are other markets which account for a large proportion of project finance loan and the US which is a leader in several other segments of funding activity does not have the same level of dominance in a project finance markets. Next we look at some of the other characteristics of project finance loans as compared to the different loan categories. If you look at the average number of syndicate banks, the average number of syndicate banks in a project finance loan is 14.5 and at the overall level it is only 10.7. So, the average number of syndicate banks in a project finance transaction is higher as compared to what you actually see in the other loan categories. 
Now, let me also mention what does this syndicate, what does the number of syndicate banks mean. So, whenever you have a large amount of loan to be financed, it is not financed by a single bank. A group of banks join together to fund the entire loan amount and the number of banks in the group is called the number of syndicate banks. So, the group is referred to as the syndicate and very often banks join together with other banks, so that the risk is diversified across different banks and each bank invest only a small amount of the loan, which is manageable from a risk perspective. So, in a project finance transaction, the loan amount is divided among a higher number of syndicate banks as compared to what you see in a traditional loan transaction. Now, the reasons could be a different, it is just that banks wants to minimize the risk that they assume in a project finance loan transaction or second having a higher number of banks also results in obtaining political support with more and more financial institutions it is possible to have a higher degree of political support with more number of banks being involved with the project. Next we look at loans with currency risk. So, what do we actually mean by currency risk? So, when we say currency risk that means, the loan is actually made in a currency that is different from the currency of the borrowing country. So, let us say if the loan is for a project in India and if the loan is obtained in US dollars, then these loans carry a currency risk. Why? Because the home currency of India is in rupees, at, but the borrowers are lending in a currency that is different from the home currency of the borrower. So, whenever you have this kind of situation, there is what is called as a currency risk. So, when you look at the loans with currency risk, 72.9 percent of the project finance loans have currency risk. So, that means, a large number of project finance loans have foreign investment in the projects. So, this kinds of gives an indication that Structuring a project on a project finance basis facilitates attracting foreign investment and in a majority of the developing countries, the capital markets are not developed to completely meet the requirements of the local needs. So, therefore, you need to have foreign investment and when you actually have project finance, then you are able to attract foreign investment in developing countries as well. So, this actually gives a very positive feature of project finance transactions and you do not find loans with such a high amount of currency risk in any of the other transactions except in the case of fixed asset based loans. Fixed asset based loans is very close, but still not higher than the proportion of loans with currency risk that we see in a project finance loan. Next, we also look at average country risk rank. When you look at average country risk rank, project finance loans have a higher rank. So, when you actually have a higher rank, so that indicates a higher level of risk. Countries that are least riskier have a lower current rank, have a lower country risk rank as compared to countries with a higher risk. So, when you actually see project finance loans, 
the average country risk rank of project finance loans are higher. So, that indicates that a large number of project finance loans are being made in developing countries. Because the developing countries have a higher risk, the average country risk rank of project finance loans are also higher. So, this again gives a very positive feature of a project finance in the sense that when projects are structured on a project finance basis, it is possible to get lenders invested in those projects and particularly it is possible to get lenders from developed countries invest in projects in developing countries. So, so the discussion that we have seen in these tables largely indicates that use of project finance uh, facilitates to attract funding for projects in developing countries. It facilitates to attract investment from overseas investors. It helps to have a larger number of banks in the syndicate and so on. So, next we move to the main topic that we wanted to discuss today, but unfortunately trying to look at the trends and various features of project finance has taken away most of our time. So, we will quickly touch upon the various sources of project finance and get into details of these different sources probably in the coming lectures. So, what are the different sources of project finance? So, the first is equity which is naturally the capital that needs to be contributed by the owners or the sponsors of the project. And then you have different sources of debt, you have the long term debt market and then you have the commercial bank market and then you have institutional investors such as insurance companies and pension funds who actually contribute to a substantial amount of a project finance capital and then you have supplier credits. Then you also have government investment being made in projects and then finally, and most importantly you also have multilateral and bilateral agency funding. So, these are institutions such as the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank and so on which actually make investments in projects in developing countries. There are bilateral agencies such as the US Agency for International Development and then you have the DFID Department for International Development of the UK the Australian Agency for International Development. So, these are all bilateral agencies which invest in development of projects in developing countries. So, these multilateral and bilateral agencies also contribute to the requirements of projects that are funded by project finance basis. So, in the next lecture we will try and look at the characteristics of these different sources and what are the common trends that we also see in these different sources.